right, so thank you. Welcome, everyone, uh, for joining us. My name is Robert Walker, Canadian Director for Hasbara Fellowships. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about how to change people's minds about Israel. Uh, when I told somebody that I was going to be making this presentation, he said, uh, Rob, you can always pick the easy topics. Um, this is, of course, one of the, uh, we perceive this as one of the hardest topics in the world, but the truth is it, uh, it shouldn't be. And I think it only speaks to the best practices that our opponents have been so successful at doing that we haven't been doing. Um, so I'll get into this just a little bit. Um, just actually, before we, before we move on to that, just a brief introduction to Hasbara Fellowships. Uh, for those of you not familiar, we're actually Canada's first uh, campus, pro-Israel campus advocacy organization. We're a product of uh, Asia International. We work on about 300 campuses, and we work with pro-Israel university students and train them how to be as effective as possible in advocating for Israel on campus. For example, when I was a university student, I went to the University of Ottawa. I was very involved. I was the president of the Israel Awareness Committee. And I was, we did a lot of things. We did a lot of events. We did a lot of programs. We did a lot of speakers. We were very involved. But if you would ask me, and if you knew me back then, you said, Robert, are you active as a pro-Israel advocate at the University of Ottawa? And I would say, absolutely I was. And if you would ask me, were you effective? Well, effective? I don't know. It never occurred to me to be effective. We did a lot of programs. We did a lot of events. But effectiveness never really came to the equation. And so too for many students, um, there's sort of a bit of a disconnect between frequency of programming and actually the effectiveness, effectiveness of actions. Whereas for our opponents, this is something that is first and foremost. So we're going to evaluate tonight a little bit of the best practices that our opponents have been so successful at identifying and where perhaps we've fallen, uh, not perhaps where we have fallen behind a little bit, and hopefully we can, uh, we can uh, catch up to them on that. So the first question is, what is the problem? We talk about how are, again, we'll step, how to change people's minds about Israel. And again, you'll you see here, um, uh, this is a comic from the very prominent Brazilian cartoonist. Uh, we have a cartoonist here in the audience, so you may be familiar with him, uh, Carlos Latouf, very anti-Israel, very prominent uh, anti-Israel cartoonist. And of course, you have here this little boy wearing a kafia, holding a teddy bear, being shot by an Israeli uh, Apache uh, uh, helicopter gunship. And uh, we laugh at this, we say this is ridiculous, of course, you'll see the security barrier, the so-called apartheid wall surrounding him, but this is one of the most iconic images of the war. We'll, we'll go over a couple more iconic, uh, a couple more, uh, iconic images of the conflict, uh, Arab-Israeli conflict as well, but the whole idea is, in your average person's mind, we talk about not pro-Israel and not anti-Israel, we'll talk about the different numbers as well. Your average person, this is an image that is embedded in a lot of people's minds, particularly during last summer's war, uh, even as bizarrely as it sounds now, the stabbing. And, and bombing and car ramming incidents in Israel, the image is still that Israel is, uh, you know, the occupier, that Israel is still the one using the excessive force and so on. So how are we going to change people's minds? First question is we have to ask ourselves, what is the problem? This is a picture, if anybody is familiar with this, this is from Very Hall at uh, York University, a hop had a lot of anti-Israel activities. Again, this is an area, a uh, campus I visit uh, more frequent than any other. And this is not any a day, but this is uh, quite frequent. You have anti-Israel protests. We had one a couple weeks ago, certainly about a year and a half ago, very common as well. So we have to identify what is the problem, not just on campuses, but off campus as well. Is the problem that anti-Israel opponents are forceful and they're full-throated and they're waving their flags and they're threatening Jews and they're intimidating Jews? Is this a problem? Of course it is a problem. Is this the biggest problem? I'm not sure I'd agree with that, but there is a problem here. So the question is, we'll have to first, if we want to identify how we're going to be able to successfully be Israel advocates as individual people who have jobs and families and mortgages and other commitments in life, we have to identify where are we not doing well and therefore how are we going to actually fix that. Does that make sense to everybody? So first we have to say, okay, what are our opponents doing so well? Are they being successful by running around f waving flags? No, they're not. There's actually two reasons they do that. One is to intimidate Jew, Jewish uh, and pro-Israel, not just students, but in general as well. Uh, we have two students actually from uh, Calgary who last about a year and a half ago were beaten up and assaulted during an anti-Israel, I would almost call it pogrom, in Calgary of all places. And again, the whole idea of when our opponents are running around with these flags and they have these big, you know, sort of groups, the idea is not so much to convince your average passerby, oh, I see the merits of the Palestinian cause. What the aim is to do is to isolate and intimidate the pro-Israel uh, voices. Uh, and the other, the other component of it as well is sort of having this, you know, the, the die-ins, if you're familiar with die-ins, is that basically painting themselves with fake blood and lying on the ground, or the apartheid walls, or security checkpoints and waving flags, not just aimed at intimidating pro-Israel 
community members or students. It's also aimed at isolating us and making it seem like a bit of a fringe conflict as well. And we'll talk a little bit about how they've been successful there. So is this the problem? I think we all agree this is clearly a problem. Our opponents are intimidating us. But is this the only problem? Is this how they've been able to successfully build an anti-Israel narrative? It's not the only reason. If you can read this, this says, from Palestine to Ferguson and racism now. Is anybody familiar with, with Ferguson? Ferguson, of course. Uh, Ferguson, Missouri, where Michael Brown, 17-year-old, was shot by police. Again, that's a discussion for an entirely different subject. But look what our opponents have done here. From Palestine to Ferguson and racism now, what, they, what they've been able to do is hijack, co-opt. I mean, co-opt isn't even a strong enough word. They've hijacked somebody else's cause, Ferguson, and they've made it their own. Uh, we're, we're suffering from racism. Again, you'll see racism, excessive force, you know, colonization, uh, colonialism, etc., etc. So what they've been able to do is take these other people's causes and make it their own. And it hasn't just been with black student unions and, you know, Ferguson. It's been with LGBTQ groups, gay rights groups. It's been with women's rights groups. It's been with labor unionist groups, progressive groups. So this is a very common theme that's been happening for 40 years. So the question is, is this the problem? We would call this coalition building or building relationships with different groups. Again, this is on campus and off campus. This isn't just on university campuses. This is across the, uh, across the, uh, the realm as well. So the question is, is this the problem? So what's the problem? How have our opponents been so successful at building an anti-Israel narrative? Is it by running around with flags? Not so much. They've been successful at intimidating a lot of pro-Israel voices by doing this, but that hasn't really won a lot of converts to the anti-Israel cause per se. What about this? Again, has it been by building coalitions with groups who, by all means, should not be anti-Israel? Absolutely. This has been a key component of it. While we've been sort of very insular as a Jewish community for 45 years, our opponents have built relationships with a lot of, uh, how would we call it, marginalized groups. Black unions, or at least you know, black organizations, aboriginal groups, women's rights groups, refugee groups, etc. And unfortunately, we're losing a lot of these voices where 50 years ago, these are the same people who are coming to Israel, living on kibbutzes, because Israel was the David and the David and Goliath equation, whereas today, Israel's seen as a Goliath. And what we've done is we're losing hold of these coalitions. And it's to our opponent's credit. This is a problem. Jews say, Israel, stop killing civilians now. Another Jew against the massacre in Gaza. Now, what you may know is that many of the leaders of the anti-Israel move, movements on university campuses and off university campuses are Jews. So this is a real problem as well. Because what happens is many Jewish students in high school and elementary school, they grow up particularly in Jewish schools. They grow up often thinking that Israel is this incredible modern miracle, etc. And sometimes they graduate, they go off to university or they go off to the workplace and they see that Israel has warts. Israel is imperfect and of course we all know that. But what the problem is, sometimes they can't quite synthesize what they've learned in their family or, you know, or, or their synagogues or schools, etc., with what they see. And so this is an area where we're losing a lot of people as well. And so here's a key component of where we're not doing well, because what we're not doing is we've tended to have a very narrow focus of what defines pro-Israel. And what that happens is that we've lost a lot of people who potentially these people couldn't reach, but they haven't been. So what is the problem? Is it that our opponents are being loud and forceful and violent? That's a problem, of course. Is it that our opponents are building coalitions and relationships with influential and growing non-Jewish groups while we're, if you will, inside the shtetl? Is that a problem? Absolutely it is. And is the problem that we're not maintaining hold on our own Jewish and natural pro-Israel partners because we haven't been able to build relationships with them from day one? That's a big problem as well. So I, wanna, I use this to illustrate that this is not a... Um, sort of a binary, black and white, you know, issue that in fact there's a multifaceted way that we need to approach this. But the idea is that the way our opponents have been successful, it's not one or two things, and so too we have to be more uh, nuanced in how we think we're going to win this war as well. So, question, um, both in Canada and the U.S. polled, I think, in 2012, so rather 2013, so it's a couple years outdated, but it hasn't changed that much. Question was, is Israel one of the good guys? Above 60 years of age, five-sixths of respondents, 83%, said yes. And among 18 to 29, it was 57%. That is a 26% drop, a precipitous drop, right? So it goes from five-sixths to about just over, uh, um, just over half. 
So what's caused this change? We have this huge drop. Again, over 60 years of age, these are the people who were volunteering on kibbutzim in the 1960s and 70s. Um, these are the people who, you know, they remember Israel, you know, overcoming these incredible odds, perhaps not in 1948, but maybe 1967, 1973. And yet younger people, their perceptions of Israel are, again, colored by the picture we saw earlier where Israel is killing out innocent Arabs, etc., etc. So the entire image is changing. So how do we reverse this? Here's another question, and here's what is very interesting. Who do you support in this current conflict? Again, the same poll. Among the general population, 36% say they support Israel. Among 18 to 29 year olds, it's shrunk by a full third to 24%. But here's the interesting thing. Question was, do you support the Palestinians? It goes from 7 to 8%, almost a negligible difference. Now, of course, once you jump here, neither jumps as well. But where's the biggest change. It's not among people who say they now support the Palestinians. It's among people who say they don't support Israel. So this gives us a bit of an insight into what our opponents have been successfully doing. Our opponents' goals, and make no, you know, make no mistake about it, is that their goal is not to build up the Palestinian cause. It is to destroy the pro-Israel or Zionist cause. Now, I see a lot of people shaking their heads. We know this. I mean, for example, the Soda Stream example is probably the best example. BDS is an ex excellent example of that. Again, very prominent on campuses, but what happened with BDS, uh, Soda Stream had a, uh, you know, the, the beverage maker had a uh, plant in Malay Adumim, a uh, Jewish community in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, if you will, and BDS pressured. They moved away. 500 Palestinians uh, lost their jobs, uh, about 3,000 people as a result. So... The issue here is that we see, you know, what our opponents are doing is that ultimately they're hurting their own cause, but that's not their goal. Their goal is to hurt Israel's image because the whole idea is, again, when we look back here and we see that we're already seeing a precipitous drop in people who are seeing Israel as one of the good guys, our opponents don't need to build up their cause because what they're doing is they're building relationships with these different influential groups. And we are, again, inside the shtetl, and what we're doing is we're not effectively reaching out to them, so what they're doing is they're chipping away at our base, a full third. Now, can you imagine what perhaps that may have been in another 10 or 20 years? Might be 10%, might be in single digits. So I say that not to depress you, not to scare you. I say that to do for two reasons. One, to empower you, because one, we can identify what the problem is. And two, we can exactly zero in on how our opponents are doing this. They are not so much, and again, it's much easier for me simply to badmouth someone else. Because literally anything I can say, I can make up the grandest and, as you know, the wildest claims in the world. And just whatever sticks is going to be helpful. But the idea is that they don't have to help. They don't have to make their own cause built up. And so this is, their, this is the approach that they've been taking. So, how have they been successful doing it? Now that I've thoroughly depressed everybody, we know that our opponents are successful at building these narratives. So how have they been able to do that? And again, I use that term narrative very purposefully. When I say narrative, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there is a subjective truth. I am not saying that. I'm saying there is an objective truth to the reality on the ground. When I say narrative, I say what our opponents are doing is they are making this cause one of personal stories. A little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, I went to the University of Ottawa. Uh, I studied journalism. Again, I, I was a president of the Israel Awareness Committee. I worked on Parliament Hill, moved back to Toronto. I worked in business for about three years, and I moved back to Ottawa. I worked for the Israeli Embassy. I was a speechwriter, director of communications. Uh, so I was sort of directly involved in this sort of, you know, uh, battle of you know, wording and verbiage and nomenclature, etc., and uh, anyway, went back to uh, Toronto, worked in digital marketing for a few years, in the, and just uh, worked, uh, started six months ago with Hasbara. So the idea is that what I'll say about you know, the approach that the Israeli government took, and again, Hasbara was initially started by the Israeli government in 2001, with the idea was is that literally those personal stories are the only way that we're going to win this war. So, does anybody know what this is? This is a security barrier, uh, the apartheid wall, as our opponents call it. This is probably one of the best images. We saw it earlier in the, car in the cartoon by Carlos Latouf, right? The little child, the helicopter gunship holding the bear, right? The security barrier around him. This is a very personal story. Now, if you see this as a headline, um, uh, I believe this is from Ebony Magazine, actually, one of the largest read 
online magazines for African Americans in the United States. Vi uh, Palestinians report increased racism and violence as Gaza offensive continues. As a Palestinian, death toll exceeds 1,000. Many wonder if the attacks on the West Bank will ever end. Now, this was a year and a half ago during Operation Protective Edge. Now, there's something very interesting to note here. What is the headline? We have the lead, and we had the headline, and then the subhead. The headline is Palestinians report increased racism and violence, and the subhead is the actual factoid. Now, again, this is not a whole discussion on you know, media critique. We have a whole different discussion on that. But what's so interesting here is that what are they leading with? They're leading not with the facts. They're leading with the personal narratives. And what, there is no reason they shouldn't be doing that. Because the, the, the idea is that we as human beings are not simply intellectual beings. We are emotional beings. And our opponents have been able to very successfully zero in on that. So when they tell personal stories about how they've endured racism and violence, Again, the media and, you know, if we call it stakeholders, your average person, will lap it up because these are the kind of ideas that they've already been fed on. Meanwhile, we just haven't told that same story in the same compelling way. The three main arguments that our opponents make, and I want to uh, address this earlier on so we can feed this into everything. Racism, occupation, excessive force. Nearly everything that our opponents say will fall into one of these three things. So we'll see that again. Here are the facts. Has anybody here not been to Israel before? Okay. Everybody, does everybody here know that Israel is only 15 kilometers wide at its narrowest? Everybody knows that. Okay. Now, if you go out onto the street and you ask an average person there, nobody knows that. Correct? Now, what if you showed this picture here to the average person walking down Bathurst Street? And you said, did you know that Israel is only 15 kilometers wide? If Israel gave up the West Bank, Israel's width would be from Steeles to St. Clair. You know what the average person would do? They wouldn't care. Why? Because it means nothing to them. In the same way that if somebody came up to me on the street and accosted me and said, did you know that the Arctic is losing 200 square kilometers every single year? Well, I don't know what 200 square kilometers is. That's meaningless to me. Someone said, did you know 300,000 Syrians have been killed in the last four and a half years in the Civil War? Well, how much is that? I don't know what that means. The idea is that these facts will not win the argument. I'm going to say that again. These facts will not win the argument. These are true. These are 100% true, but it's simply not going to win the argument. Now, before somebody says, well, hold on, are we talking about, are we simply talking about, you know, uh, fluffy stories and it's never going to get beyond that? No, don't get me wrong. Let me give you an example. Missionaries in the 19th century, when they went down to Central America, we're not talking the 15th century when they slaughtered the natives, I'm talking the 19th century, when they went down to Central America, South America, what did they do? Did they show up with a Bible in hand and start preaching the second they show up like the guy young in Dundas Square every day? That's not what they did. Because you know what, standing in a street corner, are they going to win any converts? No. What did, our, what did the missionaries do 19th, 18th century in Central America? They came in and they built roads, they built hospitals, they built schools, they were nurses and doctors. Don't get me wrong, they preached the gospel eventually. Eventually they talked about the facts, but they didn't lead that way. And the problem that Israel advocates have been making is that we lead with the facts. If I asked you... In 60 seconds, prove if I were an average person who was a neutral person, one of the what we call the 70 percent in the middle, and I ask you, I heard Israel's an apartheid state, is it? And I knew of 60 seconds. What many of us would do is to say Israel's not an apartheid state. It has Arab members of parliament. It has Arab uh, television personalities, etc. Your average person, that doesn't mean anything. Meanwhile, what's going to be if you asked our opponent? Give me 60 seconds, show me that Israel's an apartheid state. You know what they would do? They would tell a story how they were beaten up by the IDF in the West Bank. They would tell a story how their grandfather was kicked out of his home in Jerusalem. They would tell all these stories, perhaps fanciful, almost certainly exaggerated and embellished, but the idea is that which one is your average person going to hear? Is your average person going to hear, well, you know, you have to understand that there's a complex geopolitical reality. Or are they going to hear, the Zionists kicked me out of my home? Pardon the poor Arabic accent. You know they're going to favor the latter, right? And so unfortunately, this is just not the way to win. And this is what we've been doing. And this is a reality. This is, uh, this is where we go in Hasbara Fellowships. What we do is every year, we take the top pro-Israel student activists to Israel for 16 days of intensive training. This is one of the places we went. Uh, this is a picture from Rantis, an Arab village in the West Bank. Does anybody know what this is here? That's the Mediterranean Sea. You are looking over the entire expanse of Israel. That's Tel Aviv. And you know what this is here? That's Ben Gurion Airport. That is literally the expanse of the whole country. Now, if I were obviously a picture, you know, it can only tell so much. It's still, you know, a, a flat surface. 
But if I were to show you one of two things, if I were to tell you Israel's 15 kilometers wide, and, you know, etc., etc., or if I were to tell you, show you this and explain, when I was here, I saw this. I literally, and we went to a place, and I'll show you this picture. This is, this is us this past summer, a group of students. This is a place called Afe Manasha. Has anybody ever heard of Afe Manasha? I'm not surprised. I've literally never heard, found a presentation where somebody's ever heard of Afe Manasha. Little Jewish community in the West Bank. From here, you can literally see 70% of Israel's Jewish population. Now, not everyone is going to go here. Not everyone is going to be able to be here. But when we articulate these stories, whatever stories they are, if someone were to ask me, Israel small, I could give them the facts, I could talk about this. Or I could say, when I was there, I stood at a mountaintop or a hilltop in this place called Afe Manasha, and I looked left to right and I could see from one, one side of the country to the other. I literally could see nearly the entire country. I could see the airplane, I could see the entire width, just like that. Now, which one is going to have more of an effect? We know which one is going to have a greater effect, but the idea is that we need to play this more. Does anybody know what this picture is? Anybody recognize, not this particular picture, but this kind of picture? Anybody see this? So this is a gentleman, he's in the West Bank, uh, he's just outside of Bethlehem, he's holding a paper that says Certificate of Registration, and he's holding a key. Does anybody know what that key is? He is claiming that that key belonged to him before the Zionists kicked him out in 1948. Wow, absolutely, wow. This is part of their narrative. They, they, ladies and gentlemen, they have made it show and tell. We are giving doctoral dissertations and they are doing show and tell. Now. For a professor of modern Israel studies, yes, what we're doing is going to work. But ladies and gentlemen, for the 90% of people, and people aren't stupid, they're not lazy, but you know what? They have jobs and families and mortgages, and they have interests, and they have soccer practice. They don't have the bandwidth, intellectual or emotional, to comprehend and really address everything that we're asking them to do. So what our opponents, rather, are doing is spoon feeding them and saying, here's a key, the Jews kicked me out. Wow. That's a compelling story. And it's not just one person. This is part of their whole narrative now. This is in Ramallah. This is a giant novelty key over the town or mosque throughout the West Bank. They have made this part of their national story, the key. When they hold this key up, they say, this represents the Jews kicking me out. Again, just to reiterate at the risk of beating a dead horse, we've given you know, these facts and they've held the key. So, how have we been able to address this, ladies and gentlemen? We're Jews, we're smart, we know what we're doing. How have we been able to appeal to people's emotions? Well, I'll tell you how. Through infographics. Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't be ashamed. Has anybody, actually you, won't, you don't have to put your hands up, has anybody seen this from last year? I saw this. Has anybody, if you're on social media, has anybody shared this on their Facebook page last year? I have. This is something that the IDF puts out. Israel uses weapons to protect its civilians. Hamas uses civilians to protect its weapons. Is that false? Absolutely not. It's 100% true. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? Is this, does this play to my emotion? Does this make me scared or happy or vulnerable or sympathetic? No, 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 no. This one, pillar of defense, 2,248 2, rockets were fired from Gaza towards Israel in 2012. Again, it, these things are true, and, but the problem is that it works for us. For those people who are already pro-Israel or in that pro-Israel camp, we see this, we share this, we send to our friends. How many times did I see this on Facebook or Twitter last year? So many. How many times was this emailed to me last year? So many. But the problem is, is that if we are already on side, this is very compelling. But for your average person, we need a hook. Again. This are the facts. This is, per se, the gospel, the information we're trying to sell. But how do we do it? What our opponents do, again, they have that key, and they never really get beyond that. So what they've been able to do, they've sold falsehood with success, and we have not been able to sell truth. When I previously worked for the Israeli government or the Israeli embassy, I, uh, I frequently have disagreements with my superiors. And I remember that my superiors were very opposed to the idea of making it a personal, compelling case. And why? Because they said, listen, our opponents are showing pictures of dead babies, which they are. Our opponents are doing something called Pallywood. Is anybody here not familiar with Pallywood? Pallywood is basically making an entire sort of uh, industry of showing suffering. 
you know, for example, you know, they, they show a whole funeral procession, and then, you know, it turns out the guy falls out of his uh, coffin. So he gets back in, and he jumps back in the coffin, and so on. These are the kind, you know, whole choreographed rock-throwing incident. The whole idea, they've made it just so over the top as to be ridiculous, and showing pictures of dead babies. And so what we've tended to do is move the complete opposite way. And this is some of the challenge that I remember in my time, you know, speaking to my superiors, and they said, they're showing pictures of dead babies. We're not going to show pictures of dead babies. But the problem is there's a huge extreme between showing pictures of dead babies and showing exclusively infographics. There's a way to make it compelling that we haven't done. So how do we do that? So, so far we've established the following. We've established that a lot of things our opponents have been doing successfully. Some of it has been aimed specifically at building their reach, but more specifically it's been aimed at hurting Israel's cause. So have they been able to do that primarily through telling personal stories, making it very compelling in that sense. So how do we tell personal stories? What's a personal story and how do we craft one? So ask yourself what matters most to your audience. For example, let's say I'm, let's say I'm a car salesman. Let's say I'm a car salesman and I'm trying to sell a car. And you, you come in, you try, and I want to sell you a car. Now, there are two ways I can sell a car. One is to say, well, look at you, you're a tall guy, you should have this car, very high van, eh, and going in this whole pitch and vomiting all this information like this, just broadcasting everything at you. And within 60 seconds, you're probably out the door. That's one option. The other option is to say, not just schmooze a little bit, hi, how you doing, what's your name, what do you do, family, of course I need to do that. Then I need to ask you questions consultative sales process, as we say in business, consulting, asking you questions. What do you use your car for? How often do you drive? Soccer practice? Do you like to drive four by four? What's your budget, mileage, environment? What concerns you? You say, well, you know, Rob, I really, I really need good mileage. You know, I do a lot of driving. I live in Toronto. I work in Brampton. I need good mileage for my car. Well, yeah, you know, I got three kids, soccer practice, so I need something big as well. So, when you tell me what you need, then I'll say, ah, then I can craft that for you. So what, ha what happened is that instead of me vomiting or broadcasting this information to you, what you've done is you've told me how I'm going to sell it to you. You've told me, well, Rob, I want A, B, and C. So then what I can do, I craft whatever I have to sell to you. So that's what we do. For example, somebody was recently telling me his sister, Jewish, lives just outside Ottawa on a farm. And recently she found, whatever long story short, she... There were some concerning, uh, suspicious things happening next door at a farm, some things that looked like a bit of a training ground, etc. It's a little bit concerning. They called the RCP. They're looking into it. It's probably nothing. But this person was telling me, he said, my sister's Jewish. And she wasn't so concerned about this. He said, why isn't she so concerned about this? And the whole idea was that for her, fighting and caring about Israel, even as a Jew, particularly as a Jew, was not going to be framed successfully in the lens of Islamic extremism. For example, this person, she was a real envi environmentalist, you know what this fellow was telling me. She's a real environmentalist. So telling her that she should support Israel because of the, on, you know, the march of Islamic extremism is not going to do it. For example, me, I do not care two hoots about nanotechnology or drip irrigation. I don't care about Israel's technology, and I certainly don't care about Israel's environment. That's just my personality. I don't care. So if I was undecided about Israel and you tried to sell me and Israel said, well, you know, Israel has made the desert bloom, etc., etc., that's very nice, but I don't care. In the same way, what we are doing is we are taking the stories that are important to us and impactful to us, and we are trying to put that on someone else instead of using the consultative process and asking them, what's important to you? Like this lady in Ottawa. She cares about environment, so she's not going to care about Israel if we try to scare her by talking about Muslim extremists. Does that make sense to everybody? So if we know that she cares about environmentalism, we are going to make her care about Israel using environmentalism. If we know somebody cares about the plight of refugees, that's how we are going to make somebody care about Israel. If we know somebody cares about Israel, or, or in general cares about technology, or that's an interest, that's how we're going to sell them on Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot simply be in the approach where we are broadcasting information. We have to move to the approach where we are in a consultative process. We are asked, what is important to you? So how do we do that? How do we build these kind of stories? In a nutshell, again, we could do an entire session, and we certainly have on how to build a compelling story, how to use this key storytelling principles and make them effective. But in a brief nutshell, I would suggest as your homework the following. Go home, not necessarily right now, when you're walking in the shower, driving to work, whatever it is, think of five stories, 
five personal stories from Israel when you were there, or it could be from a story that you've heard. And what, in those five different areas, which one could be compelling? So make one about environmentalism that you saw, something you felt or experienced, etc. Let me give you an example of a story. So this past summer when we brought a group of students to Israel for training, we met Rachel Frankel. Does anybody know who Rachel Frankel? Her son was one of the three boys kidnapped and murdered last summer. It would be hard to exaggerate how incredible this woman is and how inspiring this woman is. But if I was going to build a story, in other words, I, thank God, did not experience what she experienced. One could not imagine. And yet, what I can do is I can take her story that she shared with me. And again, we don't, in the interest of time, I obviously can't do that now. Her personal story. You know what happened in the news, but she shared her story. And she shared what happened and how the Jewish people and pro-Israel world came together. We can use that story, and I can use that story to talk about the unity, to talk about brotherhood. I can use a story that did not even happen to me, and I can use that as one of the most compelling stories imaginable. Does that make sense? I, I didn't even have to experience it. It's incredible. A couple weeks ago, we had an Israeli soldier come in, Ed and Adler, star of Beneath the Helmet. We brought him to nine different campuses. We also did a community event. And somebody said to me, he said, you know, this is a very powerful story, what this guy is saying. And yet, how do I share his story? I wasn't where he was. I didn't face combat in Gaza. How do I share it? So the way we are able to take these people's stories and make them their own, it's not by exaggerating or embellishing or making up, but what it's by saying is, so for example, this guy is 23 years old, this soldier. When he experienced this, he was 21. So somebody might say, wow, I saw Beneath the Helmet. It was an incredible story. And you know what? I have a 21-year-old. I can't imagine. When my 21-year-old you know, goes off and he's an hour late, I freak out. I can't imagine my son doing that. Or I remember being 21 years old, and I certainly wasn't mature enough to do that, etc. So we've been able to basically take a story that literally did not even happen to us, and we've been able to turn it into a compelling example. So again, I would say as a homework, think of a few different stories that either were impactful for you and memorable for you in different areas. So one in perhaps, you know, in environment and technology and diversity, etc., and think, and then have these stories ready-made. Another problem that our opponents, or we haven't been doing, is that our opponents are taking a strategic approach and we haven't been taking a tactical approach. What's the difference? Strategic means what's the big picture. Tactical is how are we going to do it. What our opponents have been very good at doing, they've been doing things that look very grassroots. I'll give you BDS as a perfect example, boycott, divestment, sanctions. It looks extremely grassroots. It looks like the natural outgrowth of students and the general population who just can't stand Israel occupying Palestinian land. Reality, started in 2004 by Omar Barghouti in Ramallah, and the BDS resolutions are almost exactly word for word. They just copy and paste the name of the university. That's literally the same thing. But what they've done is <clears throat> they take something and they extremely calculate it, but it looks organic. It looks, it looks real. And what we've been doing is we've been doing things very half-arsed, very inorganic, but it looks very calculated. So it looks stiff, it looks planned, and yet we haven't even been reaching out. So again, strategic versus tactical. Our opponents have been setting goals. We haven't been setting goals. Uh, and they've been measuring results and, and branding very effectively. And there's a good example from Dilbert. Pointy-haired boss says, how are you doing on your unspoken objectives? My what? I'm referring to the goals that I have in mind that I've never mentioned. How are those going? I'm totally nailing them, right? If we don't know what we're aiming to do, if we're talking to a friend, right? And again, this is something that we have to be calculated about. If I'm trying to reach a friend at work at the water cooler, I have to be strategic in what I'm saying. If I'm on Facebook, I have to be strategic about what I'm posting, right? I can't on one day post pro-Israel things and the next day, post something that's, let's say, anti this or anti this. Because you know what? If I'm trying to reach this progressive friend and I'm posting things, let's say, about Justin Trudeau, it's very hard. Because you know what? He's going to see that, but he's also going to see this. So we have to think, and again, a whole different social media discussion, but the whole idea is we have to be strategic. We can't just tell facts, and we also can't just tell stories. We have to be strategic. We have to, when I say strategic, we have to know what we're aiming to achieve with them. Who are we? I'm sure you all know five people that you see on a regular, semi-regular basis who you can reach. Identify them. Think about them. Spend five minutes thinking about what matters. You've talked to these people. What concerns them? What gets them ticked? That's how you're going to get them to care about Israel. Now, what's the good news if there's any good news? 
This is a bit of an online uh, expose. So of those of you who are on uh, Facebook or social media, so this is research from Gilead uh, uh, Lotan, Israeli researcher. What he found last year, so UNRWA, United Nations Relief Works Agency, if those of you aren't familiar, it's the United uh, Nations Agency responsible for uh, Palestinian sort of civil, uh, civil affairs, if you will, $5 billion budget, okay? Now, what he did was, this researcher, he took these terms, he took tweets, so you know, mentions on Twitter of these different terms, UNRWA, different spelling, and what he found was two things. Green clusters were anti-Israel, in other words, people who were saying UNRWA in an anti-Israel context, and blue is in a pro-Israel context. What do we notice? These people aren't talking to each other. So when we're on Facebook, or we're on Twitter, or we're on sending in emails, what are we doing? We're not talking to, and we're not talking to the 70% of people in the middle. We're just talking to ourselves. Now there's value in talking to ourselves, because we need to keep ourselves educated, we need to keep ourselves motivated and confident, but we're not letting, we're not telling anybody else. We're just talking to ourselves. So how do we reach the 70% of people when we have this amazing fact and I send it out to my bubby and my friends and so on? And she said, that's very good, very nice, but what about the 70% of people walking down Young Street? They're not hearing it. We're talking to ourselves, right? We barely talk to each other, we barely talk to anybody else, right? And again, you can see this idea as well, that word of the pro-Israel, we get it from Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, Haaretz. We're talking to ourselves. We're not talking to the people who are going to be influencing others. It was an election four days ago. 338 MPs were elected. I guarantee you, we're having worked on Parliament Hill and for the Israeli embassy and on campus, I guarantee you every single one of those people who was elected was involved as far as in university, involved in campus government, campus media, student club, and beyond. When we're reaching people and they graduate and they, have, they may have families and mortgages and jobs, etc. But these people become voters, they become donors, they become letter writers to MPs and to newspapers and so on. The whole idea is that we're not reaching them, we're talking to ourselves. And again, they get their research from the same place as well. Neither of us are very good at this. So what does it mean? If you're on social media, build it. Get new people. I asked a student once, I said to, I said to them, you know, there's a, there's a non-Jewish student in your class. Are you, uh, did you add them on Facebook? No. Why not? Add them. Get to know them. Take them out for coffee. Ask them about their parents. It can look like a date. It doesn't matter. Get to know them. Because you know darn well our opponents are doing that. They've been doing it for 45 years while we've been having falafel days in the Hillel house and we've been in the shed. It sounds very harsh, I'm sorry, but that's just the reality of sort of as a, uh, as a Jewish community, as a pro-Israel movement, we have to talk to people we ordinarily wouldn't as well. So, I want to leave, you know, leave this thought as well with you. We're not ending quite yet, but leave this with, so who's your target? Not asking you to go join an association downtown or go to a part of town which freaks you out and start preaching the good news about Israel. That's not going to happen. That's not the effective way to a student. A student asked me once, she said, so I'm just supposed to talk to the, you know, this, this Chinese guy beside me in class talking about Israel? I said, no, because you know what? He doesn't care. He doesn't care about Israel. Our opponents, again, there are two things they've been doing by running around waving flags. One is make sure that we can't get to these people anymore. It's making it a lot harder. Well, it's not we can't get to them. It makes it harder. And two, it's intimidating us. We have to be strategic and we have to build these relationships. Or again, we're talking about you know, getting back to the missionaries in the 1900s in, you know, in Mexico and China. They didn't just run in and kill people. I mean, that, that worked 500 years ago. But what did they do? They built bridges and hospitals and schools, etc. That's how they build those relationships. And then, of course, eventually they, they have something to sell. But they don't come in guns a-blazing because people are going to run away. Like the example of the car dealership, <laughs> running away. So we have to think, where are my efforts best spent? Well, who are the people who I can most realistically reach? I'm probably not going to reach the guy who has a flag on his backpack that says Free Palestine now. I'm probably not going to best reach a colleague or a family member who thinks Israel actually murders Palestinian babies. I'm not going to reach them, probably. I don't want to be defeatist and say not, but I'm going to say, what about the 70% in the middle? This is where, again, we've, we've been making this mistake about focusing too much on ourselves, talking to ourselves, you know, in the example I showed earlier, or too much of our opponents getting into that sort of you know, yelling match. We need to get out of that as well. We need to think about and these sort of rallies where people are on one side of the street and the other side of the street. We need to think about how are we going to get to the 70% in the middle, right? So we have to think, who are the five individuals I know 
who are in the middle who I can reach. Not the people who hate Israel, not the people who love Israel, who are five people that I know, influential people. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. People who are influential who I can reach about Israel, right? Progressive people. This is where we're losing the war. We're losing the war among women's rights groups and gay rights groups and so on. We need to be, and again, it's a big problem as well, how we as a Jewish community and pro-Israel community have been unfortunately sort of tied ourselves very closely with, and you see this in the U.S., with conservative cause as far as making Israel, a, if you will, a partisan issue. And this is what we've seen in the United States and hopefully not so much in Canada, although I, you know, time, time will see. But the whole idea is that the more we make Israel into a niche issue, the more other people who politically disagree they're not pro-Israel anymore. Because you know what? We've made pro israel We've told them pro-Israel. That's not it. We're not talking about anti-Israel, you know, fringe people. We're talking your average person who says, you know what? I disagree on this economic issue. Well, you're voting for this person? No. We have to, we have to be open-minded about that. We have to target people who are progressive, people who are a little bit more politically we may or may not agree with. But we have to understand that, you know what? This has a wide appeal, particularly among younger people. And they have to be influential and accessible. I talk to the students as well. I say, you want to reach out to groups which are influential. It might be a guy who talks to you in class, and he's the president of the plumbing association, him and his brother, Jim Bob. Oh, and they'll meet you any time, and they'll talk to you about Israel any time. But with, respect, with, with apologies to Jim Bob, who cares? Because you know what? Jim Bob's just Jim Bob. We want to reach the people who are going to be the MPs of tomorrow, and the judges of tomorrow, and the letter writers of tomorrow, and the donors, the influence, and the opinion makers of tomorrow. That's who we want to reach. With apologies to these guys, these are not our target audience here, right? And I apologize, you know, there's sort of two portly middle-aged uh, Trekkies here. Apologize to any Trekkies in the audience. I mean, no uh, offense by it, but the idea is we have to say, who are we trying to go after? We want to get people, and I tell the students as well, people who are cool, people who are influential. This is what our opponents have been doing as well. Again, we don't just, same way, you know, for example, if you're networking, you're at a big function. I hate networking. I don't enjoy it at all. But if you're at a big networking event, is it the guy in the corner shoving food in his face? Is that the most influential? Is that, he doesn't want to talk to you. Maybe that's not who you want to talk to. You want to talk to maybe the guy who's a circle, etc. The idea is that we want to talk to the people. Because if we're talking those five people, we're not talking necessarily, you know, Granny, who, you know, eh, maybe could be convinced on Israel. Again, God love Granny. I hope, I hope she's well. We want to think about five people who are influential. That if we get to them, we're going to get to their circle. Right? We want to win influential converts. We don't just win a convert who won't win other converts. Does that make sense to people? We have to, when we're talking about thinking strategically, we have to do it in a way that we think is going to build out that cause. So who's the target on it? And as I mentioned, customize the message, customize the argument. Now, this picture. Queers against Israel apartheid. I'm going to ask you a question. Is, on what planet does this make sense? Does anybody think that this makes sense on any planet at all? This is one of the most insane things that anybody could have imagined. Queers against Israel apartheid. Insane, right? It's a big lie. It's a big lie. It's, a, it's insane. Now, people say to me, Rob, how are we ever going to reach Indian population and Chinese population? And population, what do they care about Israel? Eh, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, progressive people, what do they care about Israel? They have nothing to do with it. They don't want to hear about us. Ladies and gentlemen, if our opponents can do this, if they can build a relationship and a solid one at that with a group, and there even can be a group called Queers Against Israel Apartheid, and pardon my French, but damn well we can do it too. Absolutely. If they can do this, absolutely we can do it. So what are the four best practices to use in your conversations? You need to elevate Israel. Don't make it zero sum. Make it personal and get people hope. We'll get into that as well. So what is elevate Israel? Why support Israel, right? Tell people why. Blaming Palestinians doesn't mean people will support Israel. In the same way, remember that statistic we saw earlier. What our opponents are doing, they're blaming Israel. But you know what? The Palestinian numbers aren't going up. Right? In other words, they're, winning, they're not winning converts to their own side as they are taking converts away from us. Right? So what we need to do, we know that that's not going to work. So what we need to do is we need to elevate Israel. It's not going to be effective. We may, think, we may think it's true, and we may know it's true, and we may feel it. But unfortunately, speaking ill of them is just not a winning strategy. We have to say why Israel matters, not why they are bad. 
It's just not a key to success. <clears throat> and again, contrast to Israel when there are when there is something to blame, but it's not per se about blaming them. And again, zero sum means don't make people choose because I tell you, nobody wants to choose. We are politically correct. We are open-minded. We know we don't have all the facts. If somebody came up to me and said, you know, what do you think about the recent election in Belarus? Well, I'm just bragging because I happened to read about it. I happened to saw a headline about it. That's about it. I don't know anything about the election in Belarus. I don't know there's a dictator there. But if somebody asked me, you know, well, what do you think about this? Choose a side. Is, you know, whatever the president's name, is he a dictator? Is he not a dictator? Or this and that. Oh, don't make me choose. We don't like to choose. So ladies and gentlemen, when we are forcing people to choose, you have to choose Israel or Palestinians, Israel or Arab. We want people to choose. I want people to choose. But that's just not what people want. And so instead of trying to force something down their throat, what we have to do is we have to work around them. Because we know asking them to choose them, us or them, most people are going to say, I don't want to choose anybody. Right? Does anybody, do we all agree that this is what we see in the government? Equal-handed, even-handed. I mean, obviously, even-handed is, is, is silly. I mean, there's no, there's no comparison. I, I know there's a couple of questions. We'll try to take them at the end uh, just, just, um, uh, just all at once. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole idea is that people don't want to choose. And so when we force people to choose, they're still not going to, right? What they're going to do is take a step back and they're going to say, you know what? A, cur a pox on both your houses. You know, let, let, them, let them all kill each other like God sort them out. We're not going to win that way. What we have to do is elevate Israel. People don't see it as black and white, right? We gain credibility when we acknowledge the other side. There's nothing wrong with saying that Palestinians are suffering too. Now, how we turn that into saying, well, whose fault is it? Right? Gaza is absolutely an open air prison. Absolutely. But who's the warden? It's Hamas is the warden. Oh, yeah, for sure. It, Gaza is an open air prison. Absolutely. I agree with that. The Palestinians in Gaza are suffering. There's no doubt about it. But who's to blame for that? So you see what I did there? I am not saying that your average person who living, living in Gaza is living in a Shangri La. Now, ah, listen, you know, we've all seen these pictures of, you know, some of these shopping malls there. But we know your average person in Gaza is, is not doing well. But it's not Israel's fault. It's the, the, you know, the Palestinian Authority's fault and it's Hamas's fault. It's Islamic extremism's fault. So you see what I did there? I have, one, shown empathy for their side, which is a winner. Everybody needs to hear that. And the second part is that I've then turned it around and said, you know what, and they're to blame for it. So I'm not asking people to choose anymore because, hey, your average person, everybody wants peace. We only just need Hamas to go away or whatever it is. So we've, we've been able to shift the argument. Well, this is just an example from, uh, from Facebook. A student was saying, my heart is broken, right, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been able to make it very, um, very compassionate, right? Some examples as well showing empathy, compassion. Why is this happening? Because of Hamas, et cetera. Right? Every victim matters. No, again, this isn't just a talking point. This is, people know this. We know this is true. Right? We see, I mean, who, whose heart isn't broken when they see an eight-month-old you know, uh, killed in a, in a Palestinian hospital? Now, you and I know why they were killed. You and I know the Israeli government didn't target them. They were killed because Hamas put them there. It's still crushing. It's terrible. All the more reason people need to hear that. Right? We talked about making it personal, telling stories, telling values. Facts are important, but emotions will impact people. If I tell you a fact, you're going to forget it in an hour. Tomorrow and certainly in a month. If I tell you a compelling story, you're going to remember the rest of your life. Right? We talked about this. Lama al Satari, five months old, she was killed in an Israeli airstrike in Rafa. I have a one-year-old daughter, looks very similar to that. Whose heart wouldn't be broken look at that picture, right? Who wouldn't be? Now... I don't know the story on this girl. She almost certainly was put in a position because Hamas, as we know, fires rockets from residential areas on purpose. We know that. And yet your average person is going to read this and they are going to say, this is absolutely terrible and this just, this is, right? This is an Israeli infographic that the Israeli Defense Forces put out. Which one's going to win? Which one's going to win? Right? We don't have a shot when we do this. So, there's two stories that come out. There's two ideas that come out of that. One, obviously, we talk about personal stories. That's the only way to do it. And two is that we talk about taking these and making it showing compassion because what we've done is we've neutered them of being able to use these pictures. We don't have to fear these pictures, ladies and gentlemen, because this is not our fault. 
So the idea is that one, we need to change this and make this a compelling story. And two, we need to take that and we say, you know what, this has no power because you know what, that is a tragedy. That is a horrific war crime. And who did it? Right? Who did it? We know it wasn't Israel. Israel might have pulled the trigger. But we all know gosh darn well who's actually guilty of that. So we don't need to fear that. What we do is we need to stop playing by their rules. We need to flip it around and we set the agenda. Right? Giving people hope as well. Nobody wants to hear just some you know, pictures of what our students did. Nobody wants to hear about a long, intractable conflict. They want to hear who is going to fix it. The average person says, I don't care about what happened 3,000 years ago or 100 years ago, right or wrong. The first question is, who are you gonna, how's it going to be fixed and who's going to do it? So we need to give people hope. We need to be optimistic. right? And five, and I would say perhaps most importantly, dealing with anti-Israel claims, we have a whole session on that, it's not about who wins the debate, but who controls the issues. Let me give an example. Somebody says to me, Israel's an apartheid state. And I say, no, it's not. And you say, yes, it is. And I say, no, it's not. And vice versa, and on and on and on. Now, you sitting in the middle here, even if I win the argument, because Israel's not an apartheid state, and I win the argument, in the middle, what's he going to think? He's going to think, well, probably, right? We're getting back to that point. Do people like to choose sides? No. So even if I win this argument, what is your average person going to think? Are they going to think, Israel is not an apartheid state, case closed? Are they going to think, well, you know what, I don't know, too much. I don't know enough about it, I can't make a firm decision, Israel's maybe sort of apartheid, maybe it's apartheid evenings and weekends after six, you know, if you're on the right place. The idea is that they don't want to, that was a cell phone joke for them, and people don't want to choose. So the idea is that we have to set the agenda ourselves, because even if we win an argument, if they've set the agenda, we are going to lose. Case closed. There is no reason why we need to be responding to BDS. And we, we need to responding to apartheid claims. We should be setting the agenda. So when we see pictures like this, we don't need to fear them. We need to take those pictures and say, here is a picture of a five-month-old Gaza girl who was murdered by Hamas. We don't need to fear it. We need to set the agenda. We talk about personal relationships. I share this with students as well. 85% of our success, not just in financial and business, is not so much based on technical knowledge and the facts. It's based on our ability to communicate, negotiate, lead, build cashier, build a relationship, right? If our opponents could do that and with a group called Queers Against Israel Apartheid, it's clearly not because of the facts. So, of course, we need to lament and say that's absolutely insane how that happened. We need to learn from it and say, okay, they were, if they were able to do that, Talmudic language, Kova Homer, how much more so can we do it with other groups as well? Absolutely. So, this is a very iconic image. Anybody know what this image, or does any look familiar to anybody? Exactly. So this is a young boy in the second intifada in 2002, I think. Uh, throwing a stone in that Israeli tank. Now, obviously, we know the whole story behind this. I mean, look at this. is clearly not a active war zone. We can see these soldiers milling about in the back. This is clearly not an active war zone. Yet, our opponents have made this image very iconic. What's the picture of Israel that we are selling? I don't know. We are not selling a proactive message. We are selling a reactionary message. They're selling a message that Israel is, what were the three? Racist, occupier, excessive force. There were three. Racism, excessive force, and occupation. They are selling those messages every single day. We are not selling a message. So when we talk about reacting, we cannot win if we are not setting an agenda. So this is when we're talking about the stories that you're building with friends, the things that you're posting on Facebook, the, r the articles that you're writing in your local paper to your MP, think proactively. Think about opportunities about how you're going to brand Israel. Think about how an opportunity where, what was the most impactful thing when you visit Israel to you? And for somebody else, think about what they care about and build it based on that. The whole idea is if I leave you with a couple things, one is take what you know about Israel and put that aside. Emphasize what you feel about Israel how you felt when you went somewhere, how you felt when you saw this, what you saw. And it doesn't just have to be when you went there, when you met somebody impactful. We talked about Rachel Frankel. If you met somebody like that, somebody Israeli, somebody who represents sort of the best of Israel, take that, tell, and how do you make their story your story? How you felt, how you would act in that situation, right? 
And then what you do is go home and think about five people, five people who are influential, work, friends, etc. Influential people who have a wide social network and think, what do they care about, right? Having talked to them. I mean, we're not talking about somebody you've never talked to. We're talking about somebody you've talked to. What do they care about? Do they care about environmental? Are they maybe left of center, a progressive who maybe cares about social causes? Whatever it is, think about that. Take stories, right? And how we do. So I go up and I see them at work and I say, hey, Frank, uh, how, you know, happy Monday. Uh, how was the weekend? By the way, I want to... St no. We build relationships. We take people out for coffee. We get to know them. We ask about their kids. We ask how their weekend was. We slowly build these things. Eventually, we have a product to sell. Right? Eventually, we have a product to sell. But we're only going to get to that product if we build a relationship for us. In the same way, what we've been doing, think of an Advil. An Advil is a sugar coating. Our opponents have, so, have basically been selling the world sugar pills. There's nothing to it. But you know what? It tastes sweet, and people love it. They love it. Now, we've been sh selling people Buckley's. It's terrible, tastes terrible, but it works, right? We know it's true. We know it's true, but God, it's bitter. Who wants bitter, right? People aren't stupid. People aren't lazy, but they're busy, and they don't have the intellectual or emotional capacity to care about every single issue they hear about. So what we need to do is we need to sugarcoat what we're doing. We need to make it palatable because you know what? Again, we're selling the facts, too. We're not going to replicate our opponents and sell a bill of goods and just sell a whole lot of nothing. We're not going to stoop to that. But what we should do is sell them something very valuable and very true, but we need to sell it in a compelling way. So there's something that we can take from our opponents, we can take there, but it doesn't mean we have to wholesale sell, sell our morality. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means we have to be better salespeople. So I'll, I'll just finish up with this. Um, it's a uh, nice quote again. This is similar to uh, uh, what our rabbi said in Pirkei Avot as well. Never doubt that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I, I want to say that to you as well, is that, what is it, Sunday night? There's a lot of things you could be doing right now. You are here. The fact that you are here literally means you care about this. And not just care about this. You are willing to come here and listen to me drone on and on about this. It means that, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but it is up to you. So, sorry, if you feel that 10,000 pounds on your shoulder, I'm here to help share that weight amongst you too. But the whole idea is that this is a lesson. It's not about, you shouldn't walk here frightened and think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Feel empowered. You have literally the potential to change this, to change the world. And what we tell the students, you have to change the world. And students laugh. And I say, well, the world is changing. Our opponents are changing it. So the world is going to change regardless. The question is, do we want to change it to what we want, or are we going to let them change it? Because it's going to change. It's going to change. Just like Mordecai told Esther in the book of Esther. Hey, it's going to happen either way. The question is, are you going to be part of it? Are we going to be part of it? And are we going to let the world change to what we want, or are we going to let our opponents do it? Because it's going to happen either way. So, just before I take uh, some questions, I want to thank you all for coming. How we can continue. If you like what you hear, we do customized training workshops, social media training, best practices, media relations. Obviously, no cost to doing this, uh, to doing the session itself. So, please uh, talk to me if you want to do one for uh, you know, five, six people at a home or a synagogue or what have you. Uh, again, obviously, as a registered not-for-profit, we obviously rely on donations as well, which helps us go to do these things for students. And what you saw, obviously, was a tiny snapshot of what we provide to students every single day. And then, of course, if you know a student for Hasbro Fellowships, if you know a student, pro-Israel University student in university in Canada, we're also, of course, in the States as well, let them know we're doing an incredible 16-day training this coming winter. They come back engaged, motivated, confident, and just ready just to take on the world. So definitely let the students know about that as well. So with that, I'm going to thank you so much for coming, and uh, happy to take some questions.